when you're old school, you're, you've been taught so, you've been told so many times to start with a joke, okay, I can't help myself, but this is very difficult to come up with a joke in this subject, okay? This is very short, please listen closely, because it's very short, um, and it'll go by quickly. <clears throat> we live in a post-racial society. Oh well. Uh, let's move on from there. Um, Raise your hand if you're racist. I think we all are. I think it's as much a part of growing up in America and in every other country, although I don't have direct experience with that. And I, I, I come from close to Italy, so I throw my hands a lot, I guess. Um, it, it's as much as part of growing up in America as is learning to speak the English language. If, if you're not too recent an immigrant, perhaps, maybe, you, you know, if, you, if you're a very recent immigrant, uh, uh, that might not apply, but uh, that's the way I look at it. Um, so um, today we're gonna, I'm going to talk about some definitions of different sorts of racism. I'm going to talk about um, how we measure racism most recently and how um, the, the, the types of health problems that racism causes, both what I refer to as chronic or um, long-term health problems and acute or short-term short health problems. Let's look at the, uh, ooh, maybe we need the lights down a little bit. Can we have the lights down a little bit? This is a, a photo of a uh, African-American infant that is, uh, has a low birth weight, maybe premature. Uh, it's from a uh, PBS series on unnatural causes uh, about um, uh, disparities in health uh, based on social factors, poverty, race, etc. And this, in my opinion, was sort of the beginning of the study of racism and health in the sense that researchers noticed that uh, African American um, women had about almost three times the incidence of low birth weight babies as did Caucasian women, okay? And everyone at first said, well, this is just because the, uh, of income and education. And when they controlled for income and education and smoking and anything else we knew had to do with low birth weight, that accounted for about half the difference. Still almost double the incidence of low birth weight in African American women's babies. And that's when uh, people, somebody had the good idea, said, well, this other 50% of the difference must be genetic. So we're gonna find some African women and if, in fact, there's a gene or a group of genes that cause low birth weight in African-American women, it should show up even more in the purely African women, women that, from Africa, recent immigrants and or women still living in Africa. Well, this didn't occur. What they found was that, that African women, recent immigrant African women, had exactly the same incidence of low birth weight when controlled for income, education, smoking, et cetera, as the Caucasian women, but when they were followed over a longer period of time, that their daughters then had this doubling of the rate of low birth weight, okay? And that's when someone said, well, maybe this is racism. It's been studied, there have been hundreds of studies now, and uh, you'll never find, uh, I don't think any of them show that racism improves health in any experience, the experience of racism improves health in any way, but, and, and they don't all certainly show that racism has negative effects on health, but uh, about half will show basically no effect, or maybe it's as low as a third showing no effect, but half to two-thirds of these studies show effects of racism on different aspects of health. Um, let's go to the next slide here. So this is one definition of racism. It's my favorite one because of this idea that uh, uh, members of each race possess characteristics or beliefs specific to that race which distinguish it as inferior or superior. So that when I say all African Americans are great athletes, although some people may think that's a compliment, that's still a racist statement, okay? And I think it's something we, we need to uh, fight against, if you will. Uh, in the same way, maybe more, more, more uh, um, appropriate to this group is if you say, you make statement, all Asian Americans are respectful, okay? Uh, something we've all heard, I think. Uh, or all Asian Americans are good students. Um, uh, anyway, uh, that's why I like this definition. 
some other types of racism. Institutional racism, often called also structural racism, just the way the world is structured here, uh, defined as a pattern of, eh, you can read this. Uh, I think the simplest way to explain this is with a sort of a, uh, if I have an English teacher here, I think it's sort of an allegory, maybe it's just a metaphor, I, I forget. But if, you, if you, you move to a new house, and you've got two planter boxes there, and you say, I'm gonna plant a whole mess of flowers and make this house beautiful. One planter box is empty. The second planter box is full of uh, the worst dirt you've ever seen. Rocks, gravel, dirt, but something grew there at some time, okay? So you go out to Osh or wherever you go, and you buy some you know, potting soil and some nutrients and some fertilizers and stuff, and you dump that. Instead of mixing it all up, you just, you know, you, you don't want to be bothered by having to mix it up. You just fill the empty planter box with all this good new stuff and leave the other planter box the way it is. And now you've got two packets of seeds. You've got a packet of red flower seeds and a packet of pink flower seeds. And you've always liked red better, so you plant the red flower seeds in the brand new soil and you plant the pink flower seeds in the rocky old stuff. And the red flowers all grow up strong and high and the pink flowers Half of them grow, half of them don't, the seeds, and, and they're kind of scraggly looking, okay? And you then look at this and you declare, yeah, just as I always suspected, the red flowers are better. That is an example, I think it's, a, it's simpler than a real example of structural or institutional racism. It's, it's the environment you're placed in and the effects that has on the health of these flowers or even the way they grow. Um, then we talk about cultural racism. So that first institutional racism has to do with policies, regulations, procedures. Cultural racism based on just societal beliefs and customs. This is not written down, but it is attitudes towards other races that, that we develop as we grow up. Um, and, and these just promote the assumptions, I mean, in, in their worst form, promote assumptions that the products of one culture are superior to those of, of, of another. Then we have personally mediated racism, which is what we experience at the hands perhaps of a single or small group of other people, which, in which it involves assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others based on race. And finally, internalized racism, which is sort of the end stage of acceptance by a stigmatized race uh, of the dominant society's negative messages. And if I can illustrate this, it's, this is a, something called the social ecological model, which we often refer to in public health. I actually haven't seen a public health problem that cannot more or less be reduced to this form where when we talk about the effects of all these things on the individual, when we're talking about society, we're talking about institutionalized or structural racism. When we talk about the community, we're talking about cultural racism. When we're talking about relationships, we're talking about personally mediated racism and at the individual level talking at least to some degree about internalized racism. Um, now, in past years, well, I'd say over 10 years ago, it's still being done in some studies, we study racism or the uh, ex experience of racism by asking people a whole mess of questions, 20, 30, 40 questions about how do you feel when you go into public places where you live and, and why do you feel this way? Is it because of your income or your race or a variety of other things? Now, many of the more recent studies are just asking two questions, and they're a little different from what we've done before. Number one, how do other people usually classify you in this country? Same choices as I think we generally have, but it's how other people, because that's, that's how other people are gonna treat you and how you're gonna perceive whether people are racist against you. And the second question is how often do you think about your race? Would you say never, once a year, once a month, once a week? Um, once a, a, a day, an hour, or constantly. And in fact, one of the biggest studies done with this, these questions showed that in the United States, just comparing Caucasians to African Americans, that, and, and, and this was done just in women, a very large uh, segment of women, that the uh, Caucasian women in this country thought about their race, 80% of them thought about their race once a week or less, Whereas of the African American women, 80% of them thought about their race once a week or more, okay? And um, 
I don't think it's totally worked out yet, but most people would say it actually doesn't matter how often you think about your race as long as everyone in the community thinks about their race the same amount of time, okay? Um, that, that may, that's, that's not so much a fact as a current hypothesis, I would say. Um, all right, what about health effects? Starting with physicians. Most physicians treat black patients differently, and again, most of this research involves African Americans and Caucasians. In other countries, for example, a lot of research on this in Australia, uh, comparing the native peoples to the, uh, to the European um, uh, ancestors as well. Um, and, uh, but in studies, you know, several studies show that physicians spend less time with black patients, involve them less in decision making, and, and partly in response to this, they don't feel welcome, they avoid care and insurance, and, and they don't even have a regular physician. Uh, interesting aside to this is that I worked at Kaiser for 30 years and every five to 10 years, the word would come down from the big Kaiser in the sky, okay, that we have to give every, we have to assign everyone a permanent physician, a, a, a regular primary physician. Sounds like a good idea. Everyone says you should have a primary physician who gets to know you, but every time there would be at least 10% of the patient population that would resist this with, with, with every fiber of their soul. These are people that as near as I can determine, uh, just did not want to get any closer to another person than they had to be and would rather see someone different every time so someone wouldn't get to know their secrets. That's the way I looked at it. That's just my opinion, okay? I can't, I can't give you evidence in that regard. Um, but it just has some relation to this. Uh, then we can talk about diseases that primarily affect African-American patients. Um, that research is generally underfunded. You know, relative to the population, less research goes to black-related diseases than, than to other diseases. Black researchers with the same qualifications as Caucasian researchers, less likely to receive funding. And, and also that blacks are underrepresented in clinical trials that involve all races. When I was a graduate student in engineering and applied mechanics at Stanford in the early 1970s, before I got into medicine, that's a whole long story, but um, um, I was the only Caucasian. The rest of the graduate students in applied mechanics were all Asian, and I feel like uh, I, was, uh, I was helped along a lot more. It was uh, very important to, all the professors were Caucasian, and all the students but me were Asian. And uh, um, again, I don't have time to go into details on that, but. Uh, we experience you know, race, racism uh, from both sides and in different ways. Um, the more common health problems that we attribute to racism, certainly we've talked about increased prematurity and low birth weight, infant mortality, uh, the chronic diseases of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, um, cardio, which then in turn lead to cardiovascular disease and kidney disease, and also in lower self-reported health and physical functioning and, and finally higher mortality. And this is important. One thing people outside of public health don't realize is when you ask a person the level of their health, they're pretty accurate, okay? People that, um, for example, um, folks that say, if you ask them to grade their fitness, if they grade their own fitness as excellent, medium, or poor, uh, it's, it has a high correlation with their actual fitness. People know where they're at, and they tend to be honest in these kinds of situations. And if people uh, feel they're going to die soon, uh, often they're right about that. Uh, also, decreased mental health, okay? Variety of stress, low self-esteem, internalized symptoms that we've talked about, delinquency, intimate partner violence, et cetera. And then, now this is all hypothesis, but it relates to other health problems. This is the chain of events that we think is set into motion by racism. That you have adverse childhood events. I mean, the actually the most severe uh, effects on health are due to witnessing domestic violence in the family when you're a child, okay? That seems to have a larger effect than racism or even uh, uh, personal, emotional, physical, sexual abuse. Um, but you have these adverse childhood events, they cause stress. That stress may be manifest as you know, some social or emotional problem, let's say anxiety, which may lead to a health risk behavior, let's say smoking, may lead then to accelerated cellular aging and diseases like lung cancer, for example, that can cause early death. Um, and, and basically the same, that list of, 
of diagnoses I gave you that can, be, that can be made more likely by being exposed to racism is the same list that you see, for the most part, with things like being exposed to emotional or physical or sexual abuse or to domestic violence or to uh, loss of a parent in the family, uh, particularly due to incarceration or uh, uh, divorce. Um, so let me go back there for a minute. So this, is, this, this chain of events, everything I've said has been talking about the chronic or long-term effects of, of racism on health. And I want to just spend the last minute or two here on what I consider the acute or short-term effects on racism and health. First, by showing you this picture of the, uh, the recent uh, uh, gang war, if I guess is a good word for it, in Waco, Texas, where nine people were killed. Uh, uh, everyone involved was Caucasian. Here you have, I counted over 20 heads in here, you know, 20 heads of, of members of a biker gang that have been I'm not sure they've all been arrested just yet, but they're being detained by one policeman. They're using cell phones, they're smoking, uh, kind of looks like a tailgate party, does it not? Um, versus the recent unrest in Baltimore, where uh, here you have a protester who he did refuse to cooperate with the police in some way. I think he, they wanted him on the sidewalk and he was walking in the street, but he was, he was unarmed, hadn't killed anybody. And here he is maced and has his face in the ground and, the, and the, there are three or four policemen for one protester. Um, and uh, I don't know how to explain these two pictures except by race. I think certainly there may be someone in the audience that has more experience with either one of these events than I do who would say, well, you're missing this. But what I would say back to you is I, there may be a problem with these two slides I've chosen, but, but I don't think there's a problem that I can show you a hundred examples of pairs of slides like this for any one you can show me that goes the other way, okay? Um, and so uh, I guess that simply my point uh, today is, uh, is that we're all racist, we should think about it, we should try to improve ourselves in this regard. And uh, thanks for your attention.